So if you're kind of listening to these lectures in order, you know that um, last we talked about the fact that back in 1735, George Hadley came up with this idea how to explain these, um, start to explain these global surface winds. And remember that winds flow from a high, they'll always flow from a, from a high to a low pressure. And so what Hadley said was that here near the equator, we generally have warm temperatures and of course warm temperatures the air is kind of sparse so we have kind of a low pressure and we have up here at the sur or surface anyway we have cold pressure cold temperatures uh, near the poles and so it'll generally be a generally at the surface a high pressure and so we we should have kind of this this movement of air from the poles to let me change colors from the poles to the equator, from the poles to the equator along the Earth's surface. Now, in order to understand, and, and we're going to expound on Hadley's model, um, adding the fact that the Earth rotates, and we have this thing we talked earlier about this deflection called the Coriolis force, or the Coriolis effect. So actually that is the missing piece in, in, in going from a what we call a single cell model, one cell in each hemisphere, to a three cell model. <coughs> Excuse me. But but what they both have in common is we need to kind of think of three dimensions. Can you kind of see this sort of uh, uh, <laughs> of, of a kind of a cutout, a cross section of what's happening in the upper part of the atmosphere? So um, what what the th what the single cell model and the three cell model I'm going to show you have in common is that basically here at the equator we have rising air, ascending air, okay? And it bumps up against the tropopause and it goes either direction. But like I said, um, we need to take into account the fact that the Earth is rotating to, um, to make something more practical as to what we really observe. So here is um, Hadley's single cell kind of blown up into um, three cells. And so um, I'm going to kind of talk you through this three-cell model. Uh, honestly, this is one of those things, not kidding, uh, you might want to put under your pillow at night to kind of help it sink in. <laughs> it's neat once you think about it, but uh, there's many things in science that I just kind of need to mull over, and this is one of those things. I don't know if that's just me or what. But let me point out the three cells, and I'll kind of talk about each of the three cells individually. But like I said, if you're like me, you kind of need to mold these things over. So in each hemisphere, we have three cells. So I went ahead and kind of marked one, two, three uh, cells in the northern hemisphere. Notice what they have in common is, well, I don't know if you can see what they have in common yet. Like I said, you might just kind of need to sink in. Let me choose the color blue. I want to draw your attention here to the equator, and can you see that rising air? Okay, so just like Hadley proposed um, near the equator, and I want to go ahead and add something to this slide, something called the internet, uh, excuse me, um, intertropical I um, T intertropical convergence C zone. Okay, intertropical convergence zone, and this is the zone right here. And we'll talk more about why that is, but can you see where uh, basically air is rising up and it is hitting the, the top of the troposphere, the tropopause, and it's going either direction, just like Hadley said. But the first cell, and actually it was named after George Hadley, the first cell, this upper air descends about 30 degrees latitude in either hemisphere about and we're going to see actually that that uh, that location of interest the end of that cell um, kind, these cells kind of wiggle a little bit migrate north um, and south throughout the year but um, so the Hadley cell actually we have descending air here about 30 and that descending air has a consequence um, and so the, that descending air hits the Earth's surface, okay, about 30 degrees north latitude and 30 degrees south latitude to end the Hadley cell. Notice we have a Hadley cell in both hemispheres. And, and that descending air goes both directions as well. And so that descending air comes back and completes 
comes back to the equator and then rises at what we just talked about originally, the intertropical conversion zone. So I, I know this might be a lot to soak in, um, but it's this this air along the surface, the Earth's surface here, <coughs> excuse me, that if you are a uh, right here, these little arrows right here on this figure, those are showing you the surface winds surface winds, okay, right here, okay, and those are what, uh, what I started to say is those are what, if you're, if you're uh, counting on getting uh, a little bit of wind in your sails to go between continents, those are the winds that you were most worried about back in 1735, but um, these surface winds in each cell have names, and the name of the surface winds associated with the Hadley cell um, they are called the trade winds. Now, specifically in the northern hemisphere, they are the north, the northeasterly trade winds. In the southern hemisphere, they're the southeasterly trade winds. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, kind of uh, how they are. They end up with this sort of trajectory. But um, I'm going to leave this figure in a minute. I'm going to go go to text. So you might want to kind of go back and forth between this figure and the text. I don't know. Um, so. Let me just go ahead and maybe spend a little bit less time. Uh, in, uh, north of the Hadley cell in the northern hemisphere, we have the Farrell cell. Um, and the Farrell cell actually here in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, here in the Midwest, uh, North America, we uh, are under the influence of the Farrell cell. And so actually... We, our surface winds are what we call mid-latitude westerlies, or westerlies. Um, then above the feral cell, we have a three-dimensional cell we call the polar cell. Okay, so let me kind of add some, some text to this. But like I said, this figure is great, and um, I don't know. I wish I, you could have it next to um, you at all times for this chapter. So I'm now going to kind of give you some text, kind of talk you through the three cell model. But now remember, when we say three cells, we mean actually six cells. <laughs> we mean three cells in the northern hemisphere and three circulation cells in the southern hemisphere. And it's this kind of three-dimensional sort of kind of lifting in upper um, elevations and going either way that kind of gives us ultimately our, 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 our um, what we call a, our prevailing surface winds. So starting with the Hadley cell, remember there are two Hadley cells, but they both um, start about the equator. Now I went ahead and added something to this slide. If you printed out the PowerPoint slides, you don't have this. Um, but it, I think it is so important, um, like on the previous figure that you saw, and I, I'm going to in this part kind of return to that figure of showing you the, the, the three cells in each hemisphere. But the, just like Hadley proposed, around the equator, near the equator, now we're going to see that it wanders throughout the year as the Earth orbits the Sun, but um, we have what we call the intertropical convergence zone. And quite honestly, the reason the word convergence comes in is because that is where the northeasterly trade winds converge with the southeasterly trade winds. Okay, and this is about the equator, and we have a Hadley cell up here, Hadley cell down there. Sorry for it being so ugly. Um, so anyway, the air is converging there, and it is ascending. Well, it's ascending because it's unstable, right? And so I'm going to show you a satellite image of we have kind of a chronic band of storms, um, um, or precipitation, could be storms, could be just simply precipitation, um, uh, in that area near the intertropical convergence zone. So that's kind of what gets uh, uh, both models, the single cell and the three cell model, started. So, but the deal is, is uh, in both cell, in both models, uh, that air, that ascending air, hits the tropopause and doesn't go any further, and one leg of it goes towards the North Pole, and one leg of it goes towards the South Pole. Now what happens, and I don't go into much detail, but it's my understanding that about 30 degrees or so, I say 20 to 35 degrees in either hemisphere uh, latitude, um, what happens is the ring gets smaller, that, that band of air gets smaller and smaller, and at some point it is... Um, 
so uh, it creates basically a high pressure. Okay, because you figure as you go towards, if you're if you're looking at the circumference of the Earth going at um, upper latitude, your circle's getting smaller and smaller. So then, what happens at the top or at the end of the the Hadley cell is you have descending air from aloft because you have created a high pressure. Okay, um, and one of the things about these this descending air. Um, at the end of the Hadley cells is one of the things about descending air, and I think we've talked. I've talked recently is um, it gets smaller and smaller, and it will get warmer, and it, it will adiabatically warm. And this is where we have our deserts. So actually, if you look on a map in general, oftentimes um, in, at the end of the Hadley cell, uh, we do have our deserts. Oops, I can see I kind of got ahead of myself. <laughs> so uh, just kind of continuing the thought about the Hadley cell. As I said, um, that band of air now will descend about 30 degrees. I'm bad about just kind of making it 30 degrees. Latitude in either hemisphere ending the Hadley cell. And that descending air, now I want to, um, actually it's on the next slide. I'm going to kind of talk about the Coriolis force and how it kind of gets a little bit of a swing and creates um, those northeasterly trade winds in the northern hemisphere. Um, but one of the things is um, this descending air. I'm laughing, but it's not very funny. Um, but uh, what happens is that there's not a bunch, there's not much wind there at the at the extreme part pole part pole side of the Hadley cell. The wind is is light and variable. And so they call it the horse latitudes because historically, if you were um, taking a ship across the ocean and you ran out of wind, uh, you needed to lighten your load. One of the things, one of the ways you could lighten your load, is to is to throw off your horses. Now I'm not sure if that's true or not, but that's what I've heard. Um, so anyway, <laughs> that descending air. Now notice in the northern hemisphere, part of that descending air will head back towards the intertropical convergence zone south. But part of that descending air there at 30 degrees uh, north latitude will head north, and that will be part of the next cell, the feral cell. I hope this is making sense. Okay. So let's kind of finish up talking about the Hadley cell. We've talked about that descending air and part of that descending air heading um, uh, north to be part of the feral cell and part of that descending air then returning to the intertropical convergence zone um, to be a surface wind. And it's that surface wind that creates what we call our um, easterly trade winds or in the northern hemisphere our northeasterly trade winds. And I'm, I'm counting on you remembering something we talked about earlier called the Coriolis Force. And the Coriolis Force in the Northern Hemisphere will deflect to the right. And you might want to convince yourself of this. Kind of pretend like you are on the North Pole. Let's see. Uh, let's see. A tilted axis of rotation. So we're about... So we're right about here and we're going to go um, from... Now this is a surface wind. Uh, because it's uh, descended here about 30 and it's heading towards the intertropical convergence zone and deflection to the right looks like this and you might need to kind of convince yourself okay and similarly if you are in the southern hemisphere you are deflection to the left and it looks like this okay so what I've drawn here are your surface winds for your two Hadley cells and right where they're converging is the intertropical convergence zone so like I said, I hope this helps. Now the deal here is where they meet, um, they are going to ascend and of course that is where you're going to get your um, um, uh, precipitation perhaps from that lifting mechanism as air converges. Um, the other thing with regard to winds is uh, kind of like the horse latitudes. They are uh, generally kind of light here. These are oftentimes called the doldrums. It's funny because growing up, you know, they'd say, oh, he's, he's, he's in the doldrums. And the doldrums is not a very um, necessarily happy place to be, especially if you're a sailor. <laughs> light winds and that sort of thing. 
So I feel like I don't spend as much time on the other two cells. Um, but like I said, refer to your figure and kind of sort it out. But the feral cell, which is always ever important to us here in the, um, the Midwest in North America, but the feral cell then, remember, bumps up against the Hadley cell. And remember then the surface winds in the feral cell. Um, oh, by the way, I guess I should say that the feral cell runs about um, 30 to 60 degrees latitude in either hemisphere, about. <laughs> That's very approximate. Um, so the feral cells is, remember our surface winds, basically we had that descending air part of the Hadley cell, and that descending air was going to go north um, from the Hadley cell within the feral cell. And so... Um, Remember, in the northern hemisphere, then, we have deflection to the right, and then, so that makes it kind of go like that. And so that's why we end up with a westerly wind. Um, uh, sometimes they're called the westerlies, and sometimes they're called the mid-latitude westerlies. Let's see. Um... So, and in the southern hemisphere, you can kind of convince yourself if you want, but remember that there's a feral cell in the southern hemisphere as well, and that is going to basically have a surface wind without the Coriolis force, without deflection, that's going from the equator towards the south pole. Deflection to the left will also create um, a westerly wind. So this third cell in each hemisphere is called the polar cell. And I kind of, um, in order to think about the polar cell, I switch gears a little bit, and I generally kind of go back to what, how it begins at the pole. Let me kind of, let me kind of show you what I mean. Um, I'm finding a blank space here. This is pretty neat. <laughs> so I'm, I'm enlarging it so I can draw a picture, and it will look better, I think. All right. So here is the Earth. Here's the Earth's tilted axis of rotation. Here is the equator. That's, a, that's near the intertropical convergent zone. Okay, so we have the Hadley cells, the feral cells, and up higher we have the polar cells. So let me go ahead and put P for polar, F for feral, and H for Hadley. Okay, are we okay with that? So, um, the polar cell, I kind of think of these cold, this cold air up here at the poles, um, generally descending, kind of settling down to the Earth's surface. So we end up having, at the Earth's surface, we, we generally have kind of air that's moving um, along the Earth's surface like that. That's kind of what, actually, if you go back to Hadley's original single cell model, that's what he proposed, too. And so... Um, this air that is leaving the 90, the, the polar region um, actually then needs to be um, deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere. So actually our surface winds end up being easterly winds again up there. And one of the things about winds is we describe them generally from the direction the direction from which they are coming. So that's why we call these easterly winds. These are called the polar easterlies. And the, the neat thing, and let me kind of scan back about this. Well, I'll go ahead and, and finish this thought. Is remember we had the westerly winds here in the feral cell, and they meet up with, let me change my color here. This right here where these two winds meet up is an important uh, kind of a clash. It's clashing with uh, both with temperature because the feral, the mid-latitude westerlies would be generally a little bit warmer and of course than the polar easterlies. And so we have a temperature clash and we kind of have a direction clash. So this is called actually the polar front right here where the two cells meet. So um, I hope that helped. I know it's very much of a simplification. Let me go ahead and finish this part by revisiting one more time that a really cool figure that looks uh, kind of takes a bird's eye view of the three cell model. So here is that three cell model again. I tell you, I just there's a lot going on here, but it all it all makes sense. I think, um, and there in physical science we look for. Um, 
evidence to support our model, and there is definitely evidence to support this, this uh, three-cell model. This is very much idealized, and in the next section, it's a short section, and I kind of talk about what the real deal is a little bit more than this idealized model. Um, just to kind of uh, point out a few things that we'll talk more about, um, this descending air here associated with the Hadley cells creates these what we call um, semi-permanent high pressures. Okay, and we're going to kind of talk about those. Um, but I just think this is such a good figure. It shows our horse latitudes, our doldrums. One of the things I don't like about this figure is it doesn't um, put the intertropical convergent zone clearly between the two Hadley cells. That's pretty good.